Praise the Lord, everybody. We thank God for being here on this Sunday. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers near and far. We thank you for standing up and being the man that God has ordained you to be, to be the head, to be the covering. And we thank God for you. We pray that God will continue to bless you and give you the strength that you need to continue to be the father, not just to the children that you have brought into this world, but to your community. We have a lot of young men in our community that truly, truly need a father figure. And we applaud you and thank you for those of you that are doing it. And if you haven't, come on, step up to the plate. You're still needed no matter what's going on in your life. Your example is needed. We thank God for this day. We thank God for our spiritual father, our pastor, Superintendent Reverend J.L. Griffin. He has been an example to us, and we thank God for his willingness to be here and to be the shepherd over us. Today is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. We magnify your holy name, God. Lord, we thank you because we realize there's nothing great that we have done, but because of your grace and your mercy, Jesus, that continues to shine on us, you've given us another chance to give you the honor and the glory to get it right, God. We thank you for that one more chance. We thank you for that one more chance, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that one more chance to get it right, God, because you tell us that tomorrow is not promised to us, Lord, but we thank you for giving us one more day to get it right. We thank you, God, because you are who you say you are. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, God. Lord, we're asking you, Jesus, to please come and heal the land, heal the people, God, wake them up out of sleep. Wake them out of sleep, God, that they may see themselves, that they may be an example for somebody else. Continue to bless this household of faith, God. Continue to be what you need to be to our pastor and to the first lady. Continue, Lord, to feed him with your word from on high. Continue, God, to give him the authority and the holy boldness, God, to stand on your word, that he may preach to dying men and women across the world, and that they may come and say, what must I do to be saved? Lord, we ask you to get into the leaders' minds, God, the leaders of this church, that church, the other church, God. Lord, get in their mind, God. Let them realize that these are the last and evil days. And the word reminds us that in the last days, there should be a great falling away. And that falling away starts right here in the house of God. Lord, get into the leaders' mind that they will be what they say you have called them to be. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, wake them up, God. Fill them up, Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. Fill them up, God, with your anointing. Fill them up with your spirit, God. Fill them up with a fastness to do what the words say to do. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you and we praise you as we go on into this service, God. Let your spirit have free course, Lord. Let it have free course. Let it minister to us first so that it can be ministered to somebody else. Lord, we continue to praise you and honor you and magnify your holy name. In Jesus' name, Lord, oh, let everybody, everybody, everybody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. At this time, hallelujah, we're going to have our scripture reading by our very own missionary, Muriel Banks. Say amen wherever you are. Hallelujah. Good morning. I'll be reading Ephesians chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. And to the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I have read you Ephesians 3 verses 19 through 21. May God have a blessing to the reading of his word.
You brought me through this, yeah. You brought me through that. Mm -hmm. Lord, I'm grateful to you. You made.
Good morning to everyone that has tuned us in. We are so delighted one more time that you've entrusted us with your most valuable commodity, which is time. I have found that you can make money, Brother Rick, but you can't make time. And when it comes to the end of a person's life, the most things they want other than God is more time. So I thank you for entrusting us today with your time, and I pray to be a good steward of that time. We say happy Father's Day to all of the fathers. We pray that you will enjoy your day and that you will be blessed with lots of love. For our scripture today, I have chosen the 12th chapter of the book of Numbers, and Missionary Irving will read verses 1 through 10 today. Numbers 12, verses 1 through 10. And Marion and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? Mm -hmm. And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. Yes. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, mm. I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him yes. in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, mm. even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall be behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Okay. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. God bless you, missionary. If you would uh, backtrack again, read again for me that first portion of scripture. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. That's what I want to talk to you today about. Moses and Aaron spoke against Moses. And I want to talk to you from a subject, a criticizing attitude. A criticizing attitude. You say, why, pastor, would you preach that on Father's Day? Because over the years pastoring, I have talked with countless numbers of men that have come to me and have wanted uh, advice. They wanted counseling, Sister D. Jean, as to what they should do as a father and as a husband. And if they have sat in the office and poured out their hearts to me, Really what they end up saying to me, I don't mind shouldering the responsibilities of a father. I don't mind doing the duties of a husband. They seem to impart to me that uh, the greatest problem they are facing in their relationship with wives and their children is criticism. And so I want to talk to you today about a criticizing attitude. If you check it out, the word criticize means to attack. It means to condemn, to chastise, and to castigate. Criticize means to badmouth, Brother Rick, a person. It means to find fault, criticize. Now, you must understand there's a difference between criticizing and complaining. Complaining relates to situations, but criticizing relates to people. 
Well, let me give you a working definition, Mother Gaines, for criticism. I call it destructive criticism. That's dwelling upon the perceived faults of another person with no view in mind of their good. I better give you that again. Dwelling upon the perceived faults of a person with no view of their good in mind. Notice that I said perceived faults because your perception of what is right and what is wrong with someone may not necessarily be accurate. I know you looked at him and said he's not friendly, but that may not necessarily be true. And if you say he's not friendly, then I question why you get on his case and tell him why is he always up in some woman's face. <laughs> you said he's not friendly. So your perception of a person that you want to criticize may not necessarily be right. Some people that we perceive are lazy are hard workers. And by the same token, some people we perceive as rich are not only poor, they are poor. Some people that look the part, all they have monetarily is on their backs. And so you can uh, criticize a person from a perception and it's not necessarily true. That's the reason the Bible told us he that would have friends must show themselves to be friendly. There are some people right now that would be your best friend but you perceive them out of the wrong eye. And so when you perceive faults, don't always think that your fault finding and criticism is correct. There may be circumstances that you don't understand. Who oh, thank you, Jesus. There may be the problem could actually be with you. <laughs> yeah. You 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 were talking about your father is mean. You need to check some of the things you do. You need to check how much money he spent on bail and getting you out of jail. Poor Jesus. The problem could actually be with you and not with the other person. Because your father says you must be home at a certain hour does not make him a bad person. When you see what's going on in the world and out in the streets, you should really go home and thank your father and tell him, said, nine o'clock curfew. Dad said, you really ought to give me an eight o'clock curfew. It's possible for you to become critical of someone and be entirely wrong in your opinion. It's not criticism to dwell upon a fault now that you will observe in a person. It's, that's not criticism provided, provided that you are going to pray about that fault that you find in the person and then pursue a solution for the problem. See, when they, all of us have some shortage. And if you find a shortage in a person, Criticism does not want to seek out a solution. All you want to talk about, oh, how hot it is outside. It's hot, but get a fan. Amen. Criticism. Oh, that food doesn't look good. They didn't cook this right. Well, show me how to cook it. If I didn't dance in church just right, Mother Gaines, show me how you came in here today bopping. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
if you take the attitude that I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to help. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to that person and talk to them and see how we can make this situation better. I would say that's so much better than criticism. Notice in our text here today, it said, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Now remember that these two people are Moses' sister and his brother. It's hard, people of God, to take criticism. Hard to take unexpected and unfair criticism from those who are closest to you. People don't mind taking criticism from other people, but to hear your wife, to hear your children criticize you and call you a no count. And you're working to try to do and provide the best you can. That's heart wrenching. Oh, this won't, won't, won't shout us today, but this is true. There are some good men that have just thrown in the towel because of criticism. The last I read my Bible and the interpretation of it, Mother Gaines, the Bible said that a wise woman will build her house. And the interpreters of that scripture said the house is representative of her husband. And said what it was really saying is that a wise woman will build her husband. But a foolish woman will tear him down with her words, with her actions. Children will tear down fathers with the spirit of mo, mo, mo. Some people, some fathers are working overtime to cause you to be where you are. And instead of you looking and thanking him for that, you want mo, mo, mo. You're walking around with sketchers sneakers on and upset because he bought you sketcher sneakers and I happened the other day Sister Pam to be in a historical place and the people were selling odd items strange unusual items and I went in the store and the man had a huge rack of sneakers I looked up there I said what are these sneakers wrapped up in plastic he said oh these are collector's items. He pulled down a sneaker with one sneaker, he keeps the other one separate, $550. He said, this is the sneaker that Michael Jordan used to wear. And I said, who buys these? He said, the young boys buy them. He said, they come in here and they see the sneaker and tell their father, this is what I want. Now your father did all he could to buy you some sketches. Criticism is not in order now because he can't buy you Michael Jordan sneakers. We've got to learn not to have a criticizing attitude. Look at your neighbor and say, don't criticize so much. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. It's hard to take criticism, Sister Samuel, from those closest to you. If you will do what the Bible said, honey, gets you more bees than vinegar. He might not have done all you wanted him to do, but pat him on his bald head and tell him, honey, you sure enough a good old man. I'm sick of you don't heal anything. Oh, Jesus. The verb in the Hebrew that means spoke against is really saying they criticized Moses. That means that the primary critic in this text was Miriam. Isn't it interesting that Miriam was struck with leprosy before Aaron? Men are always usually up front, be put in the first spot. But Miriam was the one that was egging this thing on. 
And so you need to know the history of what happened. See, Moses, when he left Egypt, he went out to a foreign land. And there he married a man named Jethro's daughter. And over the years, when God called Moses to go lead Egypt, Israel rather, out of Egypt, his wife died. And Moses decided later on that he would remarry. And so he remarried, and the Bible said that he married an Ethiopian woman. And in the text here, it says that Miriam and Aaron spoke out against it. Isn't it funny how one person can get a critical attitude and drag other people into it? Ooh, thank you, Jesus. One person's bitterness can defile hundreds of other people. Miriam's critical attitude affected Aaron. You've got to be careful in your home. We live in a different time now. But some of you are all old enough to remember uh, when you grew up, mama didn't let you talk about your daddy. They tell you, say, that's your father. Respect your father. But we've come to a time in life now where mama talking about daddy to the children. Now, now, before I get too hard on Miriam, let's not forget that the Bible says she was a godly, tiny woman. She was a very godly woman. But big sister, I call her, big sister Miriam, she was the one who took Moses and put him in the basket and put him down by the Nile River. It was the same Miriam that went to Pharaoh's daughter and said, would you like for me to fetch a woman to take care of him? That was the same Miriam. Ooh, when they crossed the Red Sea and got over on the other side, the Bible said Miriam grabbed a tamarind and became the first praise worshiper out in the wilderness. Miriam loved Moses. Miriam was a godly and a righteous woman, which tells us that we should never, ever think that we've gotten so deep and so spiritual until we can't be found guilty of criticizing. We are just as vulnerable as Miriam. None of us can say, well, that's behind me or criticism is not an issue for me. I don't struggle in that area. Watch yourself sometime and find won't criticism tempt you. Somebody gives a compliment to someone and the first thing you say, but. When that but comes out, that negates all of the compliments and criticism is getting ready to take place. Well, thank you, Jesus. So really, I came to the conclusion that when they murmured against Moses, they said to Moses, say, listen, say, you take too much authority on yourself. Say, you want to make out God speaks to you and then what? Say, but God also speaks to us. Yeah. See, sometimes people want to build themselves at the expense of tearing you down. Well. And so they said to Moses said, you don't need to keep talking about how God speaks to you. So don't you remember last week I preached and he spoke and anointed me to preach. But Moses didn't even have to fight for himself. God spoke out and said, now Moses and Aaron said, you all have stepped over the line. You are criticizing my anointing. You are criticizing one that I choose to speak face to face to. I don't talk to other prophets like I do with Moses. You've got this uh, people of God listening to me today. Look at the man in your house. And look at that man as the 
head of the house. Look at that man as the king of the house. The old folk used to teach us, and the young folk don't teach that now, Mother Mary, but the old folk used to teach us there was no silverware that was too good in the house for the king to eat with. No plates were had that much gold in them until only guests eat. They're taken out when Christmas time and guests. But the king of the house should be able to eat on the gold plates any time. I'm preaching about Father's Day. If you want him to go out and get a second job, tell him how good he is. You want him to help wash the dishes. Don't criticize and talk about your left streaks on the dishes. Don't tell him about your left two glasses in the sink. Tell him, honey, you did a marvelous job. Oh, you don't hear me. Let me stop here. Whenever we develop a critical attitude, we'll experience the same consequences that Miriam and Aaron experienced. It doesn't destroy your relationship with God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But it changes your fellowship with him. Look what I put here. Sin hinders our relationship with God. Let me see if I can help you understand what I'm saying. Having a critical attitude towards your husband does not mean that he stops being your husband or being your father, but it definitely will affect your relationship. Ooh, Brother Griffin, you said a mouthful then. Want me to read that note again? Having a critical attitude towards your father or husband does not mean that he stops being your father or husband, but it definitely will affect your relationship. You get critical towards him, and he'll go to the same restaurant he used to go to with you, but he'll sit there half an hour, and you might get three words out of him. <laughs> God pays attention, church, to the way we treat one another. And if you have a critical attitude, if it's hindering your relationship with your husband, then I'm here to tell you it's hindering your relationship with God. God rest there. Remember, Mother Samuel, Brother Bolger used to tell us a woman in Florida named Mother Gamble, Gussie Gamble. I went down uh, 21 years old and met Mother Gamble. And Mother Gamble was a woman full of wisdom. And she said to me her husband was a pastor of a local church, but Mother Gamble was the state supervisor of the Florida area. And she said to me, she said one night, uh, church was going rather late, and said, I told the uh, usher to tell my husband I was going home because I have to work in the morning. She said she went home and normally where under the rug she said they would leave the key, the key wasn't there. And she said she had to stay there 45 or 55 more minutes until her husband got home with the key. And she said, Brother Griffin, when he did, she said, I went up one side of him and down the other. And I told him, don't you ever move that key from under this rug again. She said to me, but that night I could not sleep to save my life. She said the next morning I got up, she said, and pride tried to invade me and say, don't say a word to him. She said, but the spirit of the Lord told me you owe your husband an apology. She said, I tried to fight against it and tell the spirit, how do I owe him an apology when I was the one locked out of the house? She said, but the spirit told her, he's the head of the house. And 
She broke down and she said, I told him, Mother Griffin, honey, I'm so sorry I spoke to you like I did. Those kind of people are the type of people we need today. Young people don't learn to criticize your father. Thank you, Jesus. If your life is spiritually like a wilderness, if it's dead, it's dry, it's cheerless, it's joyless, maybe it's because you've allowed a critical attitude to come into your life. Some people have become so critical, Mother Mary, they go to bed criticizing. They wake up criticizing. They say it's raining when they go to bed and they're crying about it. When they wake up and it's 90 degrees, they start complaining, criticizing. It's too hot outside. You've got to guard against a criticizing attitude. It's a choice that not only injures your relationship with other people, but a criticizing attitude injures your relationship with God. Well, that's enough of that. Let me close by telling you this. If your relationship with God today, listening to me, if that relationship is broken, there's something that you can do about it. God gives us the answer in 1 John 9 and 1 and 9. And he says, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus. As long as you say something different about criticism than what God says, then your fellowship with him is really linguished. Your fellowship is broken. God said to us, Mother Gaines, love ye one another. God said to us, speak kind to one another. Now, if you decide to speak critical of your brothers or sisters, you're in violation of God. And so what happens, not only does your relationship get severed with you and me, but also your spiritual relationship with God gets severed. The last I read the Bible, it told me, Mother Gaines, he said, I'm such a God that I want peace among people. He said to us, if you happen, and in life it's going to happen. Now, don't make out like you never had an argument with your dad. I told myself when I was 15 years old and my father wouldn't let me do what I wanted, and then he reprimanded me, I looked, and when I got in another room where he couldn't hear me, I said, when I get 21 years old, I said, I'm going to put a whooping on you you won't never forget. Amen. <laughs> but sometimes we don't know what criticism is doing. Criticism will cause you to suffer in the long run. As I got older and found out why he was telling me to do what he told me to do, why he wouldn't let me do what I wanted to do, I found out that criticism was not rightfully founded. He loved me, and I didn't understand it. And so I'm closing today by telling you, the Lord said that your fellowship with him is broken if you become always critical. Stop being critical. Don't come to church and all you can think about, the music too loud. The microphone not loud enough. The choir didn't sing upbeat songs. The preacher's suit didn't match his tie. The preacher preached too long. He didn't uh, tune up. You can criticize all the time. But somebody that wasn't a critic looked around Mother Gaines and saw all those folk in the church. Some ugly, some pretty, some fat, some skinny, some dark, some light some tall, some short. He said all of those folk he saw, but he didn't have a critical attitude. He looked at all of them, Mother Gary, Mother Mary, and said, behold, 
how good and how pleasant it is. Tall, short, ugly, fat, skinny. Behold how good it is to dwell for brothering, to dwell together in unity. You got on Chanel number five. She don't have on any cologne. But nobody criticizing. Y'all don't talk to me. We wonder sometimes now why we as a church are missing it. We are missing it because we too critical. Some people come in church and all they come in church for is for their souls to be touched. For their spirits to be renewed. They came in here and they're a woman, but they didn't come in here with the idea you're going to criticize them because they got pants on. They didn't come in here with the idea that you're going to criticize them because they had sneakers on. They come here looking for help. We've got to learn to stop criticizing so much. Oh, I'm finished, Brother Gray, but... Mr. Walmart, Mr. Walmart didn't become that size by criticizing folk. Mr. Walmart don't care if fat folk come in his store. He don't care if poor people come in his store. All he want to know, do you have some money? And all we need to know today from people when they come here, do you have a soul? We are supposed to be in the soul winning business. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. I just heard the Lord said the emphasis is on winning. He that would win souls must be wise. And wisdom, brother Rick, is not criticizing folks. Wisdom is not telling folks you are nothing but a two-faced person. Wisdom is telling the person, you know, said, we're going to get this right. Amen. Oh, yeah. I said, whatever the problem, we're not going to dwell on the problem. We're going to dwell on the solution. And so I say to you, Lord, if it's a critical attitude that I have, please work on me. I want to get rid of that critical attitude. Lord, I'm sorry if it's a sin against you to be critical, then I don't need to be doing that. See, some folks never get drunk, never commit adultery, never curse, but they have the sin of criticism. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We don't have this kind of preaching they used to have when I was coming up. But the preachers and the missionary, they point their fingers and, and they tell the folks in a minute, say, keep your mouth off the preacher. That's right. That's right. All right. That's right. You might not believe it, but he's your spiritual daddy. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mothers used to point their fingers at children in the home and tell them, don't you talk about your daddy. That's right. That's right. That's right. But we've come to a time now where mama talk about daddy more than the children. So my message to you this Father's Day, make your father feel good. Thank him for what he is doing. Thank him for what he has done. Because the truth of the matter, you couldn't have gotten where you are if, it, if he hadn't done anything. You were born into this world helpless. You couldn't feed yourself, couldn't take care of yourself, anything. But whatever he did, it might not have been all he should have done. But thank him for what he did do. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you today. I pray that everyone listening would work on this attitude problem of criticism. It's a temptation that the devil brings to us. But God, you want us to not criticize. You want us to find good things in people. As we today come to the conclusion of this message for Father's Day, I pray that every father would have a wonderful day, that they would feel loved, feel appreciated. They know their shortcomings. They know what they should have done and didn't do. But 
touch their hearts and give them to know to take pride in the fact of what they have done and did do. Your blessings, I pray, be with us on this Father's Day. In Jesus' master's name I pray, amen. God bless you, and I thank you for listening to me again today. Once again, happy Father's Day to all of you. I'm not a biological father, but I have so many spiritual children. And I really felt good today. My uh, nephew, Brother Travis, whom we raised, he came home to celebrate Father's Day with me. And the first thing he did when he got here, you all see me in these leather sneakers. And he came in and he said to me, he said, it's time for you to get like the modern preacher. <laughs> I had on my regular black shoes. And they were patent leather and they're shining and I thought they were looking fine. He said, this is what you need. This is what I brought you for Father's Day. And so I want to say to Travis, I love him and I thank him for coming to celebrate with me today. From uh, 12 until 1230, is it Sestina? I will be outside. Uh, Missionary Woods and Sestina has said that I should be there to receive any cards that you all might bring. It's not so much the monetary, but just the words. I spend sometimes, when you all give me Father's Day cards, I spend sometimes two and three days reading over the cards and the words that you all say. And sometimes, that's why I talk about criticism and preconceived things that are not necessarily facts. Sometimes I look at the cards you all give me, and I wonder, I said, is that my that <laughs> It's kind of like, kind of like the fellow that passed. And when he passed and they were having his funeral, they opened the door for people to come and have remarks. And everybody was getting up talking about what a wonderful fellow this deceased man was. And said, finally, Sister Pam, his widow, his wife, she was sitting on the front row. She couldn't take it any longer. They talked about what a good husband and a good father and this and that he was. She touched her son in the side and she said, Raymond. And he said, what, mommy? He said, get up and go up there and look in that casket. See, that's your daddy. <laughs> so, 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 so sometimes I read you all's cards two and three days. <laughs> but I do appreciate the monies if you put the, put something in there, but I'm not really seeking big money, but if you bring a card, I would really appreciate it. I'll be there from 12 until 12.30 to receive them from you. We are looking at opening the doors of the church again. We are, I'm zeroing in, I believe, on the second Sunday in July. It's not concrete yet, but we are second and third, but right now my mind is leaning towards the second Sunday. Sister Astina will be here and she will be taking temperatures and uh, doing the precautionary measures that we come together. Now, understand the devil is a deceiver. And the devil doesn't want the people of God to come together. My wife and I were out of town, Sister Tiny, for a few days. And uh, where we went, people were everywhere. So now don't let the devil start talking to you, telling you about the COVID could be at the church. He didn't tell you it could be at Walmart when you went there. And so we've got to open the doors. We've been cautious and we followed the uh, directions of the medical people. And they say that it's time now that we can open the doors. So we're coming back and uh, we're going to trust God. We're going to practice precaution, but we are still trusting God. I'm asking those of you listening to start preparing your hearts to come back to church. Start asking God to use you as a vessel. That when you get here, you bring your fire. Sister Marcella, bring her fire. Missionary Irving, bring her fire. And when we get all our fires together, we can sure enough have a bomb fire. If our ministry is blessing you, we once again ask you to hit Give Lafay and send us a donation. We'd be ever appreciative and keep you in our prayers. Until next Sunday.
The blessings of the Lord be with you all.